Uh, I'm known in the Pokemon community as Trainer Thatch, and uh, more importantly, I'm the host of the Puggle Podcast, the longest running Pokemon podcast. Um, we've been doing it for way too long, and hopefully that gives me some authority to talk about Pokemon. Uh, and to talk about science, I'm a PhD physicist. I have a PhD in physics. Uh, I actually just got it up the street at Ohio State back in 2018. Uh, it was a good time being here in Columbus, and it's great to be back. And just as a side note, I really like working with us. I think they're pretty. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Puckle, I keep saying th this thing, uh, stands for the Pokemon Underground Champions League, and as I say on the show every single week, it's a nonsensical name we came up with in 2007. Uh, it means absolutely nothing. I was 16, and he just wanted to put words together. And that's what we did. <laughs> We do a weekly show, we got a cast of co-hosts, something like 10 different people rotating in and out, so we get a lot of different opinions about uh, pretty much anything from the video game to the trading card game. We're very competitively focused, we talk about the current meta, stuff like that, um, and we talk about spin-off games, and honestly it's mostly just Pokemon talk, with lots of Pokemon talk. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we also have a Pokemon, we have a community, we have a Discord, we do, uh, I'd say once every three months we do a tournament, uh, where we actually give away physical prizes, you give away like a copy of Sword and Shield to anybody who wins them and stuff like that so far this year. It's just, it's a good time. Uh, so, you're not here to hear about who I am and what I do. We're here to talk about Pokemon and do some science at the same time because, I mean, these, these are both two topics that I really love and I think it's fun to be able to put them together. So, why do you Pokemon at all? That's a, that's a good question that we need to talk about. So, Pokemon evolution is actually more akin to Metamorphosis, I'm sure a lot of us are aware. It's kind of like watching, uh, it, it's like getting a caterpillar to a butterfly. And so we've got, uh, you know, caterpillar goes to metapod, and then metapod to butterfly. It's probably the first evolution that most of us saw in our Pokemon journeys. And it, that's actually a very good representation of what it is as, as opposed to evolution. And so Professor Rowan from the Sinnoh region uh, actually said it's a way of Pokemon reaching maturity in the games. Uh, and uh, many Pokemon, though, need a little bit of extra push other than leveling up and strengthening, and they do so like with stones. We'll see, like Pikachu, for example, that is like highly regular on the boat. And he needs a stone to evolve. You got the Eevee to flare up from the recent Detective Pikachu movie, where they need to evolve. So you need that, like that little extra push. And uh, same with friendship. You've got things like Togepi to Togetic. They they need to be good friends with you. Golbat, for some reason, needs needs to be your friend. Uh, I don't know why, but it, it does. Uh, trading, maybe something from the trading machine or whatever the trading is, uh, gives it a jolt of energy to evolve further, uh, other than like I think Carablast and uh, oh, Shellman. Those are weird. Uh, weather, I think the big one is, uh, I think the only one is Gooey to Gudra. Uh, I could be wrong, or not Gooey to Gudra. It's like Gooey to Gudra. I got yelled at about that on stream yesterday. Um, and the other one that we're going to really hone in today on is just a certain location. Pokemon have to be in a certain place to evolve. Why is that? What's it doing to the Pokemon to make them evolve? So, specific locations, let's break down a couple of them. So, the first one is the Boss Rock. Uh, this all starts with Generation 4, where you have Mizion, that's how you can take Eevee there, you level them up. You can take Ice Rock, similarly, you take Eevee there, a lot of Eevee. Uh, you take Eevee there, you get Glacia. Uh, and the new one that I didn't know existed is Mount Latakila from Generation 7. Didn't know that was a that was an evolution like area. I thought it was the hail that evolved Crab Roller into a Crab Roller. But apparently it's just Mount Latakila. He's taking there evolves, which is stupid because the ice rocks in there too. So like, you know, game design, whatever. Uh, we'll just throw that out. Uh, but the special magnetic field is special in more ways than just being called a special magnetic field. Uh, because it also evolves three different Pokemon. It's the only location that evolves several different Pokemon because they really messed up by not talking about, they're not combining her abominable and the ice rock, so I never made that decision. So you got Magneton, the Magnezone, that was past the Crobo Pass, Charge Bug, Beatable, and with the Charge Bug push, I love that. I love that. Uh, <laughs> and so the, the real big thing here is uh, they all have something to do with electricity. Um, obviously, these two are electric types, and then We've got Nosepass here, who got like a ton of electric moves in his move pool. He learned Zap Cannon. Like, that's crazy, dude. Like, that's such a cool move. Um, and so, uh, I love electric types. We've got a guy wearing a Hawaiian shirt, Watson. Uh, I, I wear Hawaiian shirts all the time. Uh, that's also the. Uh, that's the name of my cat. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's a model now. Um, he's going he's to blow up on the red of his shirt. 
Um, and so let's talk about magnetism, what it is, so that we can understand the special magnetic field, and what it can be doing to make these Pokemon evolve, giving them an extra push to become something they weren't before. And so what is magnetism? We're going to start diving into physics. So uh, honestly, there's so few of you. If you want to like just yell questions at me or something, you're more than welcome to. Um, so uh, magnetism is a physical phenomenon that's, that's created by moving electric charge. So the charge has to be moving. You can't just have a static charge sitting there. Um, I'm sure some of us from maybe high school have learned like you have positive and negative charges and they attract and repel each other. So you actually have to move one of those to create a magnetic field. Uh, and it's a, like I just said, it's a force that can attract or repel just like charge. You can actually have magnetic fields that attract or repel. I mean, some of us probably have fringe magnets. Um, and that's exactly how that works. You attract the, you attract the, uh, magnets, the magnets together and you make them stick together. Uh, but it's not to be confused with animal magnetism, which can help you spread orbital winds, uh, which is an important thing. Uh, so it takes a moving charge. So this is just a, this is a small diagram of an electron. It's a very basic elementary charge. Um, it has a negative charge. And it's just sitting there all by itself. It doesn't actually produce a magnetic field. It has to be moving to produce a magnetic field. Uh, it's only when you go ahead and you move that charge, it starts moving around, that you can create a magnetic field. So that's really an important distinction. You have to have that charge moving to be able to do that, to create, create a magnetic field. So, I don't know what the next slide is. So why are some materials magnetic? So if we go back to our, our good friend, the electron, um, every material has an electron, or has multiple electrons for this matter of fact. And what happens is they spin, we're going to put that in quotes because they don't really spin. It, nobody's actually like looked at an electron, they're really, really small, and you can't actually look at them, but we know that they have some kind of magnetic field attributed to, to themselves, and we say that's because they're spinning. So because they're spinning, they're creating a magnetic field. And that spin can be up or down, or some combination if you really want to get into quantum mechanics, and I don't want to do that today. Uh, and so uh, when you have them in atoms, they really like to pair up, and so then you'll have a, you'll have a spin up and a spin down electron right next to each other, and those fields will just cancel out. So that's, a, so that's an important factor when we're talking about why some materials are magnetic. So iron is the biggest, baddest case of magnetism in the physical world. If you have a magnet, you probably have some form of iron in it. Uh, and that's because you have these electrons just sitting around this iron, and they're typically unpaired in the valence, in the, uh, the outermost electrons. They're typically unpaired, and so they have this natural magnetism from being, uh, being spun. So you just, iron's just naturally magnetic. It's, uh, it's a cool thing. And what will happen is if you have a bunch of iron, like put together like in a rock, say, uh, the little magnets will misalign unless you start to run like an electric field or another magnet across them. You can actually get them to align. This is called a concept of magnetic domains. Uh, very irrelevant for what we're talking about, but I like these pictures. Um, and that's how you get your household magnets. It's typically iron of some kind put together, and it's a, it's, it's a pretty simple mechanism. So uh, there's some fridge magnets. Um, I found as many as I could. We got we got monkeys and the guys um, made out of minion. Those are awful. Um, but this is a, this is how magnets were first discovered. They literally found rocks that could stick together. Uh, that is that is why they found magnets. They, they found that you could pick up a rock from the ground in ancient Greece. You could walk around and you could start picking up other rocks with them. Uh, and this is actually uh, the, the the name is pretty funny for the scenario because this is actually called magnetite, uh, which is very close to our friend magnetite. <laughs> Um, and this is actually how the old compasses were made. They found they found these rocks, and they would just sit there, and they would make little uh, make little needles out of them to make compasses, so that they knew which way was north, which way was south. Uh, it's, a, it's a really big thing. Uh, so the other the other thing that's really cool is you can actually start combining electric charge with magnetism to get some really cool effects. And the big the biggest one, and the one that uh, affects your daily life, whether you know it or not, is called electromagnetic induction. You've probably heard this term before, but uh, it's uh, it's actually really, really important to understand. Um, so what is electromagnetic induction? It's the ability for a changing material, for a changing magnetic field to create a current. Um, and it powers most of your daily life, like I said. And it was also a really cool move on a DCG card in 2007. Uh, zero energy. It takes no energy to use it. You can attach two electrics to whatever Pokemon on your bench. And like, that's crazy. Uh, if, if only it wasn't a stage one. Uh, <laughs> there's, my, there's my tidbit. That's all I know about the TCG now. Um, so uh, you see this used every day, like the transformers you see on the on your power lines. 
the ECO live electromagnetic induction. Your hard drive and any of your computers, they use that. That's how they get their ones and zeros. They, they'll magnetize little pieces, and you'll if something's magnetized, you'll get a one or a zero, depending on how it's magnetized. And then it's how we generate electricity in, to put these lights, turn those lights on. You actually have a magnet that's being driven by a piston going in and out of the loop of the wire to create electricity. And then more recently, actually, uh, wireless charging with phones. Uh, this is actually this is this is some of the coolest technology ever. I like being wireless in every way, and doing it through power is really cool because what's happening is this little pad is just changing, creating a, a changing a magnetic field, which actually powers your phone. So we're just going to go a little bit into how this works. Uh, so these are the two guys that discovered electromagnetic induction, both independently. Uh, this is Joseph Henry with the Pikachu readers, and this is Michael Faraday with the Attention Pad. And they mounted independently of each other. They both should be credited equally, but we named it Faraday's Law anyway. Um, and so these are fancy equations that physicists will use to describe electri uh, electricity and magnetism. They're called Maxwell's equations. Uh, thankfully, today we don't care about most of these. Uh, we only care about this one. And even then, like, this is a scary equation if you don't know calculus, so we're just going to trick it down a little bit. And so we're going we're gonna to break down what most of this equation means. Uh, this delta t means a change in time. So we're changing something with respect to time, whatever this Greek letter is, if you want to join a fraternity or something. And then uh, we're going to describe what this EMF is here in a minute. Um, so let's say we have a coil of wire. This is something like what Michael Faraday did. Uh, he, took a, he took a coil of wire and he put an electric current through it uh, without a PPU, unfortunately. And uh, what happened is, you notice that when he did that, he created the magnetic field. Uh, and the way you can actually choose what direction that magnetic field is, is you can do something called the right hand rule. Um, and this is actually useful in your life outside of this talk because that's also how you can know which way to turn your screws if you're working on stuff in your house. Um, because if you just take your right hand and you bend it in the direction of the current, um, that's the way the magnetic field is going to go, the way your thumb is pointing. And same thing with screws. Which way you turn this, which way your screw's going to go. In or out. Uh, so it's better than righty tidy, lefty loosey. Uh, because where are you turning it right? What's right? You're rotating things. Um, so let's say we have two coils together, because Michael Faraday said, if I can go ahead, and I guess Joseph Henry, but they didn't name the law after it. Uh, if you can create a magnetic field with a by running current through a wire. Why can't you create a current in a wire by creating a magnetic, by putting a magnetic field through it? So he said, let me take two coils right next to each other. Uh, I'm gonna run a current through one of them, and I'm gonna see if I can get a magnetic field in this one, or a current in this one. And when he did it, he was really disappointed because there was no current that ran through the wire. Uh, then he turned the experiment off, and then current started flowing through the wire. And he was very confused by this, um, Oops, and he was very surprised, because uh, <laughs> he did not expect this result. Um, so what happened here, he, he induced what's known as a, the electric motive force in the wire, in the second cable. And that's because that's the force that it takes to push electrons through a wire. We're just going to call that the electromotive force, or EMF. So that's the, that's the left-hand side of that equation we saw earlier. And so he said, well, let me take a bigger coil of wire and see what happens. So we increase the diameter of this wire as it gets a bit fatter. In the final name, just coil fat. And, stuff. Uh, and so he ran the current through, and then he turned it off, and he found that he got a larger current flowing through that wire. And so what's going on here? Um, it turns out that the area that the magnetic field is flowing through actually makes a difference. Uh, so he said, "Well, what happens if I increase the magnetic field through the first coil and put it through the same side?" And when he did that, he as well got a larger magnet, uh, current through the second wire. So we can actually describe that through a term called magnetic flux, which is described by this Greek symbol phi. And it's just the strength of the magnetic field, which is given by E in physics terms, and then the cross-sectional area that that magnetic flux is going through. So how much magnetic flux are you, how much magnetism are you capturing, essentially, is in the magnetic flux term. And so that gives us our, our full equation of EMF, um, which is actually a voltage. Um, is equal to the change in magnetic flux with respect to time. So if you just change the magnetic flux over and over again, you should be able to create a magnetic field through a wire, um, or a, a current through a wire. <laughs> um, so what does this have to do with Pokemon? I just talked your ear off a lot about science. I just did a physics lecture. Um, I apologize. And so let's get to the fun stuff. This is what you're here for, right? Nobody, nobody was just like, man, I want to go to a science talk today. I, I really need to get my bachelor's degree. And 
So let's talk about, we're going back to the special magnetic field. I mean, this, is, this happens everywhere. We, we called the talk uh, the core net effect, which I hope is what enticed you to be here, because I made a really fancy title. Um, Mount Coronet has a magnetic field. The power plant in Calus has a special magnetic field. Uh, what is this? This is uh, Chargestone Cave in Unova has it. Uh, we also have it in the Fast Pony Canyon. And so the special magnetic field, we, what makes it so special? And so with my physics knowledge, um, I kind of came to a conclusion that what's happening here just does not have good contrast. Um, and you just have a various non-uniform magnetic field throughout this area. And I'll explain why uh, I think that here in a moment. Um, but the, let's start with Nosepass. Let's talk about him. Why is he evolving in this special magnetic field? And in his Ruby entry, it says his nose is always pointed to the north. The two of these Pokemon meet. They can't turn their faces to each other because the magnetic noses repel each other. So it sounds like they're refrigerated magnets, essentially. I mean, they're compasses, but they're refrigerated magnets. Um, and then it's obviously a, uh, a compass because it's magnetic nose faces north. Travelers check nose pass to gain their bearings. I mean, he's, he's, he's that. there's also another one that says he like harvests his prey by attracting it with his nose, which is really weird to me because what's nose pass? Uh, if anybody has the answer to that question, I'd love it. Um, <laughs> what is he eating, right? Right? Maybe just inhales the food. Yeah, just inhales the food. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, but I think he, I think this magnetic field is in his nose created by permanent magnets. Something like iron, like we were talking about. Those rocks you can just pick up and start grabbing other rocks. Um, so, <laughs> so we're back to we're back to our magnetite. Uh, not to be confused with magnemite, and uh, it creates a magnet in so nose that helps them figure out which way to look. And it is uh, it's just like a compass, which is rotated on the side of the earth for his image. Uh, but when he walks into this magnetic field, this strong magnetic field, because the earth itself right now is creating a magnetic field, it's what repels charges uh, coming in from the coming in from outer space and giving us all cancer. Um, and it's part of the reason why we can't colonize Mars uh, right away, because we need to figure out this magnetic field problem, because it's actually really important for life here on Earth. But if he's walking through this non-uniform magnetic field, it's really going to mess up his compass. And he's just going to kind of start spinning around in circles, not know which way is north. And so my thought is, when it starts doing that, uh, when he's walking through this special magnetic field, he, he just needs to compensate for that by creating a larger magnetic field, which is what exactly what the Pokedex says Chromopass has. And he creates extra mini noses, and he gets a little mustache full of like, little iron flakes, and he gets a really cool hat. <laughs> I haven't mean, explained the hat, but he's got one. Um, so that, that explains those facts. But let's, let's talk about Charger Bug. Charger Bug gets, uh, gets uh, a lot of cool stuff here. He's actually, I, I really like the case of Charger Bug because I think it makes the most sense out of all of them. Uh, because if we read this, we learn that he's just a battery. He's just a little external battery that he can prove. Um, <laughs> And so it, it stores electricity on camping trips. People are grateful to have one around because, God forbid, we go without our phones uh, for five minutes. And then when he eats food, he actually he actually stores energy in his electric sack. So he's just a battery. And so wait, remember this picture? We have a wireless charger, and that comes from a changing magnetic field. So as charger bugs walking through this changing magnetic field, we're inducing an EMF inside of charger bug, and then he ends up evolving into Pico Bolt. Which we're going to talk more about Pico Bolt later. I think I still have time. What time is it? You have plenty of time to go on. Oh, perfect. Perfect. I'm doing great. I'm going way faster than I thought I would. Um, so, what about Magneton? Magneton is actually a really cool case. Um, it's If you think about it too much, you're going to cry. But uh, he's actually really interesting because um, we have this other concept called induction heating, um, which some some places use, typically foundries actually use this to, to melt metal. Um, and what happens is by rapidly changing the current back and forth, you're rapidly changing the magnetic field up and down. And when you do that, you can actually start to heat things up. Uh, and you can make them red hot. That's exactly what's happening right here. You just make it red hot. And what happens is, this is a really cool chip. This is my favorite chip of this entire presentation. Uh, we just got a piece of magnetic material with a wire that's making, this chart, making the current go back and forth, and it gets red hot. And just wait for it. melts and it just falls right on out. So, yeah, poor Magnemite, right? <laughs> and so, so, we, so we have this oscillating magnetic field that's causing us to heat up. Um, and actually, if you notice, these, these wires are super thick, and that's because they're actually uh, 
too big because you have to run you have to run water for these because they'll get super hot and then the lines themselves will melt. So that's why they went so so thick and uh, these are a pain to them. I know from experience. Um, and so we need to take a look at our special magnetic field and make a few modifications to it. So instead of all the magnetic field, the lines just pointing upwards. Um, I say it's a bit crazier. And we got lines that are going up and down off of the side. And so we just have this constantly changing magnetic field that uh, oh, that causes magneton to melt with using the magnetone. Uh, <laughs> it's a little painful to think about, but it, it explains it pretty well. Um, and because I still have time, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, four things with magnets in Pokemon because railguns are really cool, and I wanted to talk about railguns. Uh, so the Lola Golems, at least the Lola Golems, like a really good example of that. He literally has a railgun on his back. Like that's literally all he has to do. Like that's his design. I have a railgun. Um, also, Pikachu kind of has a railgun in his mouth, uh, though I'm going to disappoint you here in a few minutes. Um, so railguns, what are they? I don't know if everybody's heard of railguns. I hope so. Right? Okay. Here. Um, so the Navy's actively researching these weapons right now. Um, I'm currently actually a researcher for the, the Air Force. So I'm working on. Uh, high power electronic materials, which are similar to the research they're doing. And so uh, they're working on these actively. I think they have a couple in service right now. I mean, railguns are really cool because they fire projectiles super fast. So fast, in fact, they light the air around them on fire. Like, they're just moving that fast through the air. It just catches on fire. This is a typical railgun, uh, like, shot. It's, it's nuts. They're really cool. This is the reason I got into physics, because when I was in high school, I was told about railguns, and I sat down and did the math to figure out if I could make one operate off of a car battery. Um, uh, spoilers, you can't. Um, you need, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's disappointing, I know. You can't make, I mean, it's probably good that people aren't like shooting things at two kilometers per second from their cars, but um, I mean, that's, the, that's for like me being at like Goodale Park in like now. Uh, and, and so it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's probably good that we can't do this from our car batteries. Um, you actually end up needing one of those transformers, and we talked about doing it, but we didn't do that, thankfully. Uh, so how do railguns work? This is a really, this is probably the simplest picture you can get for one, um, unfortunately. So if we remember our electromagnetic induction that we were talking about earlier, we're running a current down through this wire, down through this wire, and there's actually a piece of metal that connects these two rails, and then the current flows backwards. And if we remember our right hand rule, put our thumb in the direction of the current, we can wrap around and see which direction the magnetic field is going. And what happens is you have enough magnetic fields going around that you end up pushing a piece of metal forward through a railgun. Uh, and you need to have like crazy high currents, and that's why you can't do it with a car battery, and it's really sad. Uh, but what they typically do is they'll just have the, like a plate like this that's, that's right there, and they'll hold the projectile right in front of it. And then the plate's just reusable over and over and over and over again. Uh, and that's, that's essentially how railguns work. And uh, Alolan Golem really likes to use his real gun. Um, pretty much every single one of his Pokedex entries is about him using the real gun. Like, it's like, even if the rocket isn't fired accurately, just raising the opponent will cause numbness, numbness and pain. I'd say at two kilometers per second, yeah, that's going to hurt. Um, and then it can't, because it can't fire boulders at a rapid pace, it's been known to see these nearby Geodude and fire them. So it's taking a Alolan Geodude, launching it in its back, and they're just going. Um, Shooting at a flying sight. And then uh, it's grumpy and stubborn, and rock out of the And then it shoots large rocks that are charged with electricity. Tremendous electric shots are flung across the whole area of impact. <laughs> this thing loves to use real gun. Uh, Alolan is the coolest Pokemon, and I wish more people appreciated it. Um, you can run it really, really well in the uh, never used here. I've done it, it's fun. Um, and so, how about Weakable? How does it use its real gun? Uh, well, so we're going to skip around a little bit. And it, it says it concentrates a lot of electrical energy in its jaws and shoots them out. Um, it's got an organ which helps it create those like that electric charge. And it just, it just fires and shorts electricity from its railgun looking metal. Uh, but or, I would say electricity probably isn't a solid like we're seeing from a Lolan Lolan where it's literally shooting rocks out. Um, and that's actually more akin to what's called a plasma. Um, and so it doesn't actually fire projectiles. Um, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't fire projectiles, and it's actually more akin to a plasma railgun, which sounds really cool in theory, because who doesn't want to shoot plasma from, like, a plasma rifle or something like that? I mean, we're, we're in Missouri town, I think we have, to, we have to say, yeah, we have, like, we can shoot plasma from our guns. Um, and, 
Uh, unfortunately, it's impossible because uh, plasma needs to be in a vacuum to really work efficiently. They do have some plasma railguns where, uh, let's go back here, uh, where instead of using uh, just this plate, they actually create a plasma to help push the plate forward. But you're not shooting the plasma, you're just using the plasma, and that's still not as exciting. Um, you want to shoot like you want to shoot like blowing balls of energy, um, and so uh, this is actually used a lot in research. Though um, if you've heard of nuclear fusion, uh, nuclear fusion really leans on this kind of technology. Like they'll shoot plasma into a vacuum chamber to uh, to help try to fuse uh, hydrogen atom into a helium atom, and uh, they use it also in high energy density research, which is very similar to the fusion. Um, and actually, NASA's looking into it right now for propulsion technology um, to get our spaceships from here to Mars much quicker with much less energy, much less fuel, uh, as opposed to just spitting out like, I don't know, whatever chemicals they want to in outer space. We can't pollute outer space. we got plastic falling from the sky in Antarctica. Um, so, uh, to finish up, let's talk about the fossils and natives today. Um, that is it, Pondy. That's something else came up with. Um, I hope that's a shame. Somebody else is working on this talk. Um, and so by looking at real-world physics, uh, we can come to some really cool conclusions about what's happening with both water and their biology. Um, I really like doing it with physics because I, I just I love physics. Obviously, I spent nine years of my life studying it, and now I'm doing it for a living. Uh, and we can manipulate currents, and electricity magnetism is probably the coolest field. I think it's cooler than quantum mechanics because you can do a lot more stuff that's going to affect your life uh, readily. You can do this at home. Like you could do a lot of this at home. You could build an induction here, and you should be safe when you do that. They'll say like, "Oh, some guy at the panel told me I should go melt metal in my backyard with wires." Um, don't blame me. And uh, Pokemon can use the physics themselves to to do some really cool stuff. And unfortunately, the only negative I can come up with is we didn't have time to talk about work Um That's unfortunate. Uh, J Pod's really cool. That's a different. That's a different podcast. <laughs> so uh, I think I went through that pretty fast, unfortunately. But um, it was 45 minutes last night, I promise. And uh, so if you want to know who we are and what we do, uh, we, we are a Pokemon podcast, like I said today. And if you want to contact us, find out who I am, more about me, you want to listen to me every week talk about random stuff like this, uh, you can find us in all these places. We're also everywhere that podcasts are sold um, for free. And uh, like we're on Spotify, CastBox, SoundCloud, and <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, so I guess that's it. If you want to stop and talk about physics, because I think there's time, right? What time is you have time. Oh man, I went through that way faster than I should have. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> we can go ahead and we can talk about it. Stick around and check. We've got room for another half hour. Um, but yeah, that's everything. So thanks for coming.